When discussing Canada in space, it is hard not to discuss Canadarm. In one iteration or another, the Canadarm has been utilized in space for nearly 40 years. From the space shuttle to the International Space Station, and soon taking part in missions outside of Earth's gravity, Canadarm has been there. Today, we will be looking at Canada's own family of robotic helping hands. In June of 1969, NASA was looking to the future. On the cusp of landing the first man on the moon, they were already deciding what would come after Apollo. Originally, there was the Apollo Extension Program, which would have seen the use of the already developed and proven Apollo hardware to complete other missions than landing on the moon. These were cancelled, however, and NASA started looking into a concept that had been investigated since the 1950s a reusable space plane that could shuttle astronauts and cargo into Earth orbit and return them. This led to NASA planning on creating what would eventually become the Space Shuttle. They invited Canada to take part in creating the shuttle, as they had a good working relationship with them already, working together on the Alouette and ISIS programs. Canada, excited to have an opportunity like this, took a look at the options available to them. After learning about a small company named DSMA Atcon, that developed a robotic arm that could load fuel into a nuclear reactor, the newly formed SPAR Aerospace teamed up with DSMA ATCON to propose a manipulator arm that could be used to deploy satellites from the shuttle's payload bay. Although intrigued by the project, NASA was skeptical. NASA was seeing increasing budget cuts and was hesitant to fund what they considered to be a high-risk project. Not to be discouraged, they continued to work on the concept and, in 1974, with the help of the Minister for Science and Technology, John Sauvé, NASA approved the project. Just a year later, Spar Aerospace was finally awarded the contract and started to develop the manipulator, with the National Research Council of Canada overseeing the project. NASA had very strict guidelines for the manipulator, requiring specific speeds and dexterity, maximum weights, high precision, and of course, it had to be extremely reliable, as it would be what made sure most shuttle missions would be a success. With these guidelines in mind, and over half a decade of development, the shuttle remote manipulator system was born. At 15 meters long, a diameter of 33 centimeters, and weighing only 410 kilograms, the remote manipulator is very much like a human arm, with two rotating joints at the shoulder, one at the elbow, and three at the wrist. Even though the manipulator could not even support itself in Earth gravity, it was still a very strong piece of machinery, capable of lifting up to 266,000 kilograms while in orbit. On February 11th, 1981, during a ceremony at the Toronto Spar Aerospace Plant, Canada signed over the arm to NASA. It was here that head of Spar Aerospace, Larkin Kerwin, who would go on to become the first president of the Canadian Space Agency, dubbed the SRMS Canadarm. The first Canadarm was delivered to NASA in April of that same year, and they promptly got to work fitting it to the first fully operational space shuttle named Columbia. Out of the five computers aboard the space shuttle, Canadarm used a whole computer as its brain. It would go on to perform tasks such as helping astronauts on spacewalks, deploy and capture satellites, knock ice buildup off the waste dump exit, and it could even dock the shuttle to the Soviet Mir space station. On November 12, 1981, Space Shuttle Columbia launched to space for the STS-2 mission. The mission was originally supposed to last five days in orbit, but due to a fuel cell failure, 
was cut down to just two days. The tests planned for Canadarm were cancelled. Astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Truly decided, however, to stay awake during a scheduled sleep, and during a loss of signal period, started testing out the Canadarm anyway. When Mission Control gained signal with Columbia again, the image of Canadarm being used was shown. Excitement ran through both Canadian and NASA teams, with Carl Doach, Deputy Program Manager on the project, recalling, The first image, the now famous inverted V with the Canadian wordmark, displayed for the world to see, Canadian technology at its best. It was happiness, relief, and excitement all at once. Pilot Richard Truly, during his control of the arm, said, Okay, the arm is out for the first time. Working great. It's a remarkable flying machine, and it's doing exactly as we hoped and expected. Canadarm was a huge success and would go on to have four other duplicates made, one for each of the shuttles in the fleet. But it was not all a happy ending. On January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger launched for the STS-51L mission. 73 seconds into launch, a structural failure destroyed the shuttle, along with the tragic loss of astronauts Francis Scobie, Michael Smith, Alison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe. The mission would have seen Krista McAuliffe become the first teacher in space who planned to teach two lessons from orbit, and Ronald McNair intended to play the saxophone for a track on the Jean-Michel Jarre album, Rendezvous. We also would have seen multiple science experiments, many of which focusing on observation of Halley's Comet, and the destroyed Canadarm Model 302 was to deploy a tracking data relay satellite. Unfortunately, this would not be the final tragedy to occur. On February 1st, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia was returning to Earth after mission STS-107 was completed. During its launch almost 16 days prior, a piece of insulation foam broke off from the external tank and struck the left wing. During re-entry, this damage caused hot gases to break through the heat shield and destroy the shuttle, and tragically killed the crew consisting of Rick Husband, William McCool, David Brown, Kalpana Chala, Michael Anderson, Laura Clark, and Ian Ramon. This disaster provoked NASA to request an extender piece for the Canadarm, which would allow for easier inspection for damage on the underside of the shuttle. The Canadian Space Agency, officially formed in 1989, responded with the OBSS, the Orbiter Boom Sensor System. This was, essentially, a modified Canadarm that did not articulate and could attach to the hand on Canadarm, extending the arm's length from 50 meters to 100 meters, and allowing Canadarm to inspect the bottom of the spacecraft with a combination of cameras, sensors, and lasers. The OBSS also had handrails along the sides so astronauts could make repairs if need be. This was actually used on the first shuttle flight after the Columbia disaster, Space Shuttle Discovery Mission STS-114, to remove some gap fillers that the OBSS detected protruding out between a few of the heat shield tiles. The three OBSS that were delivered to NASA for each of the remaining shuttles were constructed relatively fast being mostly made out of backup parts for constructing and repairing the existing Canadarms. The success of Canadarm was vital to the success of the shuttle program, and in turn many other programs from around the world. It even led to NASA offering Canada the opportunity to launch an astronaut. This prompted Canada to create the Canadian Astronaut Program, and eventually the Canadian Space Agency. The arm lasted for 30 years, retiring on July 21, 2011, alongside the Space Shuttle. Over its life, Canadarm did many amazing things, including the deployment of the famous Hubble Space Telescope and assisting in the repair of the P-6 solar array on the International Space Station. Space exploration owes a huge gratitude to Canadarm. In 1984, 
United States President Ronald Reagan announced plans for space station freedom to be built by the end of the decade. This was to be the next huge step for NASA, and would be what Reagan saw as putting the USA back to being the top innovator in space exploration, while also bolstering their relations with the other countries who would cooperate with the program. At this time, he extended an invitation to Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney to have Canada take part in the Space Station Freedom Project. He accepted the invitation, and they signed a Memorandum of Understanding for Canada to build a mobile servicing system for the station. In 1988, Canada awarded the contract to their familiar friends at Spar Aerospace to build the MSS. But all was not going well for Space Station Freedom. Over the years since President Reagan's announcement, Freedom kept running into development issues, primarily one being the simplest, money. Space Station Freedom was clearly going to cost too much for the USA and in turn NASA, which was estimated to cost roughly 15.3 billion US dollars in 1989. Today, accounting for inflation, that would have cost 30.6 billion US dollars or 41.3 billion Canadian dollars. Multiple redesigns were done between 1987 and 1993, but NASA's budget kept shrinking and the station was not getting cheaper. Originally, Space Station Freedom would have seen the United States, Europe, Japan, and Canada work together on the station. But on the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Soviet Union was planning a successor to its Mir space station, which would have been called Mir 2. However, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and the newly formed Russian Federation had little money, so they could not afford to launch a project on the scale of Mir-2. So Russia joined the Freedom Team, and with that, in 1993, United States President Bill Clinton announced that Space Station Freedom would evolve into the International Space Station, combining designs from Freedom and Mir-2, while splitting costs between more countries. The station eventually became a reality, with the first modules launching on November 20th, 1998. Spar Aerospace was still hard at work creating the mobile servicing system. This would be what serviced, repaired, and built most of the International Space Station. In 1999, Spar was bought by McDonald, Detwiller, and Associates, and renamed to MD Robotics. But that did not stop the flow of work, and on March 12th of that same year, the creatively named Canadarm2 was completed and signed over to NASA. Canadarm2 is 17.6 meters long, with an elbow hinge in the middle of the arm, and a three-jointed wrist slash shoulder on each end of the arm, with each joint being able to rotate 270 degrees in its direction, giving it much more motion than that of a human arm, and at that, Canadarm. It weighs 1,497 kilograms, is 35 centimeters in diameter and can carry up to 116,000 kilograms, which is less than what Canadarm 1 could carry, but sacrifices had to be made in the pursuit of mobility. On April 19, 2001, Space Shuttle Endeavour launched on STS-100 with the main goal of delivering Canadarm 2 to its new home, the International Space Station. Then, on April 22, NASA astronaut Scott Parazinski and CSA astronaut Chris Hadfield performed a 7 hour and 10 minute spacewalk during which they installed Canadarm2, bringing the new arm to life and fittingly completed the first spacewalk by a Canadian. Canadarm2 can be controlled in multiple ways, the first of which being via two robotic workstations on the ISS. One is located in the Destiny module and one in the Cupola module though only one of these can be used at a time. The other ways the arm can be controlled is via the ground from either the Christopher C. Crapp Jr. Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, or via the Canadian Space Agency in Longueuil, Quebec. Canadarm2 actually has two other add-ons that help comprise the mobile servicing system. The first one is the mobile base system designed by Northrop Grumman. The MBS is a rail that runs along the truss, or structure base, of the ISS. A cart can run up and down this rail and has four power data grapple fixtures, one on each corner, 
that Canard Arm 2 could attach to and ride to get to the other side of the station while still holding a payload. Keep in mind that normally, Canard Arm 2 moves around the International Space Station like an inchworm, moving end over end via the power data grapple fixtures located around the station, but it cannot move around while holding a payload. But why are there four of these power data grapple fixtures? Wouldn't you just need one? Well, that is where the second add-on comes in. The Special Purpose Dexterous Manipulator, aka Dexter, is the second robotic manipulator that lives aboard the International Space Station. Dexter, which is also known as the Canada Hand, has a torso with two smaller count arms attached to it, so it can perform much more precise tasks, and so it can move itself around the station one arm at a time. Dexter has a latching end effector, exactly like Canadarm 2, on the bottom of its torso, so it can be attached to the MBS and move across the station while still holding a payload. On March 11, 2008, Space Shuttle Endeavour launched on STS-123, delivering the first Japanese ISS module, Kibo, and Dexter. On March 13, Canadarm 2 grabbed the payload carrying Dexter and attached it to the MBS, where, on March 14th, Canadarm2 grabbed Dexter and powered it up for the first time. Finally, on March 16th, astronauts Richard Lenahan and Mike Foreman finished building Dexter on their 7-hour and 8-minute spacewalk. Built by MD Robotics, Dexter is primarily used to replace orbital replacement units on the station, which are parts essential to the station function, but not designed to be set up inside the pressurized modules. These include controller boxes, pumps, storage tanks, antennas, and battery units. Canadarm2 is a marvel of technology, helping build most of the 177 billion US dollar or 240 billion Canadian dollar International Space Station. It has assisted countless astronauts on spacewalks performed over its nearly two decade life, as well as capturing and birthing arriving cargo ships, such as SpaceX's Dragon, the Northrop Grumman Cygnus capsule, and JAXA's Conatori capsule. It even worked in tandem with the Space Shuttle Canadarm on occasion, with these events now being referred to as Canadian handshakes. The usefulness and excellence of Canadarm 2 cannot be overstated, as it is one of the most important pieces of space technology in the modern space age. It's so important, in fact, that it is prominently displayed on the Canadian $5 bill. So what does the future hold for Canada's robotic family in space? With NASA directed with the goal of landing the first woman and next man on the moon by 2024, the Lunar Gateway was announced as a small space station in lunar orbit for astronauts to make one last stop before hopping into their lunar lander and descending to the lunar surface. Although the priority of the Lunar Gateway has shifted, with it no longer being planned to support Artemis III, the first crewed mission to the lunar surface, Canada is still part of the international crew that will comprise the formation of the Lunar Gateway. On February 28, 2019, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced that Canada would invest 2.05 billion Canadian dollars over the course of 24 years to the Lunar Gateway. MDA Space Missions, the successor to MD Robotics, will design and construct Canadarm3 which will support the Lunar Gateway much in the same way Canadarm2 and Dexter support the International Space Station. Canadarm3, at the time of recording, will have an 8.5 meter arm as well as a smaller, more dexterous arm with no set measurement and will move around in the same fashion as Canadarm2. It will include an advanced onboard AI to make Canadarm3 completely autonomous with the ability to repair itself and a new 3D vision sensor system to map its surrounding area. The arm will, however, have the ability to be controlled via astronauts on the Lunar Gateway or via robotics controllers at the Canadian Space Agency. It appears that Canadarm3 is an evolution of Canadarm2 with a combination of Dexter into one system. 
More will become clear about the full capabilities of Canadarm3 as development of both the arm and the gateway progress further. Gateway is intended to make travel to the moon and eventually Mars much easier. With Canada's contribution, it is very possible that within the coming years, we will see the first steps by Canadian on the lunar and Martian surfaces. Canada's involvement in space travel in the past and future is something to be very proud about, and I couldn't be more excited to see what we do next. <laughs>